Chapter Three in the Royal Suite. A beautiful young woman stirred uneasily in the early slumber of the evening. Eleven floors below her, in the foyer of the Hotel Manhattan, the after theater crowd of visitors thronged and buzzed happily. But the girl, after an unusual day of anxiety in a strange land, was ill at ease, with fitful dreams. The Paris clock of Her Highness delicately struck two musical notes upon the chimes, to indicate the half-hour. At the same instant, as though by echo and vehement confirmation, two revolver-shots resounded in the corridor. The girl shuddered as she opened her large, dark eyes, sitting bolt upright in bed. She heard a slamming of doors, a growing hubbub, in the usual decorous hallway outside, and her feminine curiosity almost conquered the aristocratic reserve to impel her to rise and discover the origin of the hubbub. She was spared the trouble, for suddenly the door of her boudoir received a vigorous thump. The lock crashed and swung open, admitting the rays of a red electric lamp in the corridor outside. The portal swung shut with even greater promptitude as a dark body leaped over the threshold. Madre de Dios! she screamed. Then, after a gasp, Who's there? The intruder backed against the door, working with the top bolt, which was still intact. She could see the vague outline by the dim glow of the moonlight which streamed into her room. Then, as she seemed preparing for another cry, he turned toward her. Shh! Don't make any noise! He whispered vibrantly, audaciously. The girl slipped from her bed and drew a flimsy dressing gown around her. What do you want? Silence. She had reached the lamp on the small boudoir table near the bed. She switched on the electric light. They stared at each other wide-eyed, but stirred by different feelings. Hers was the fright of a woman finding herself in the power of a strange and desperate man. His the battling alertness of a man fighting for his own life against odds. It was Jarvis of Kentucky. Despite his immaculate evening clothes, the blanched face, drawn mouth, and the revolver in his hand made him appear to her as the personification of that vague terror of the unfamiliar dark which all women and children know so well. He crouched there, reading the character in her haughty, tossed head and imperious eyes. The details of her beauty he ignored, remembering only three important facts. She is young. She is frightened. But has not lost control of herself. He reached forward and tossed the switch of the lamp. Again, the moon was the sole illumination of the room. A voice outside in the corridor came to them. What's the row? Somebody shooting up the hotel, was the reply from another throat. Not a sound, do you understand? Whispered Jarvis as he backed toward the door again. What right? She began. Quiet. The voices in the corridor were closer now. Where'd he go? Look on the fire escape. No use. He's on this floor, I tell you. The girl advanced toward him, her own spirit asserting itself, as she realized that help was within calling distance. Yet she did not call. What is it? What do you want? What have you done? Warren slipped the revolver into his pocket to reassure her. It's all right now. I'm not going to harm you if you will just keep quiet. Is that clear to you? Is it money you want? All the money I have is on that dressing table. Take it and go. He shook his head, now observing the wealth of hair, the health, aristocratic poise of shoulders and arms, and the depths of her eyes. I'm not a burglar. I don't want your money. Well, then, what do you want? She was beginning to be impatient. There was a sound of rapid steps down the corridor. 
Jarvis sprang toward the door, his eyes still intent on hers. Listen, they're coming. They mustn't search this room. Do you understand? You must put them off. He assured himself that the upper bolt was intact and shot tightly. I'm not what you think I am. Is there no way out that way through the door over there behind you? She shook her head. No, that is my maid's room. The fire escape, where is that? In the hall opposite. Jarvis snapped a finger, angry at his own mistake. I thought that red meant it was in this room. Oh, hell. Uh, I beg your pardon. A faint smile turned up the corner of the red lips, and she shrugged her shoulders ever so lightly. Well, you know where it is now. Why don't you go? Jarvis shook his head with determination. It was evident that the surprised and surprising young person would be amenable to reason. He had many logical reasons at his command. I can't go that way. They'll be waiting in the hall. He declared as he studied the windows and portals. The red light in the corridor fooled me. I thought the fire escape would get me to the floor below, where I could take an elevator down during the hubbub. There they come again. As the odd pair stood, with bated breath, quick steps and a running fire of conversation could be heard in the hall. It was evident that the chase was getting warm. The girl studied the poise of her curious visitor. It was not the cringing attitude of a criminal. In the lines of this well-built figure there was the unmistakable grace of a gentleman to the manner born, the fearless confidence, despite his predicament, of a man confident of his own justification. She was puzzled her curiosity gradually overcoming her outraged feelings and her natural resentment against his assured usurpation of the situation. This was a new experience for the lady of the lacy filaments and the regal poise, yet it was far from unpleasant to meet such calm masculinity. She switched on the light once more, to feel a surprising satisfaction in the impersonal, unabashed honesty of those steady blue eyes. Jarvis became conscious of a twinge in his hand, and looked down at his left hand, observed a little rivulet of blood dripping down to his fingertips. He quickly drew his handkerchief from his pocket, as though to cover the wound before she saw it. The action and his motive did not escape the observant dark eyes. Her sex asserted itself. She advanced, nervous once more. You are wounded. What has really happened? You must rest that hand. I almost stopped one of the bullets, that's all. You see, it was not one-sided. But I'm afraid it will be, if they get me now. I don't see how the devil— Here he ran to the shaded window to peer at the twinkling street lamps far below. Oh, damn. The girl's manner froze again. She stepped back instinctively, and yet that bandaged hand compelled her eyes. She spoke slowly. You have evidently shot someone, and are making me shield you from justice. Warren Jarvis shook his head, with that straightforward look which was so convincing. Not from justice, but from the law. I thought they were the same. His smile was bitter as he retorted. No, not always. There would be no justice for me at the hands of the law. Justice was not accomplished by the law in all these years. She dropped a white hand to the table by which she stood. Well, that is not for me to decide. I must only— You must only listen. You shall decide. At least you shall listen— in order that you may forgive my intrusion, my selfishness in compromising you as I have done. He hesitated, and for the first time color came into the drawn cheeks. A softening echo was observable in her own. If you find me guilty when I tell you, I'll, well, I'll take that door or anything you say. Your presumption is ridiculous. 
were her words and yet she did not call for assistance jarvis realized that he had at least won a foothold for his plea and he had not given up his dogged hope i wouldn't call it ridiculous a man has a right to argue for his life but she parried could any decision be more unjust than mine must be when delivered at the point of a pistol jarvis took the challenge he laid the weapon upon the dressing-table by her side and crossed the room leaving her between himself and the door now my dear lady there is nothing to prevent you from covering me calling for help and solving the riddle as you please after all what does it matter whether the end comes to-day or to-morrow for it would be impossible to elude the police you don't understand i know but i'm not flying from justice it was a case of shoot or be shot you will notice that only one cartridge in that revolver has been used but listen they're on the right trail at last he noiselessly crossed to the door and listened to the renewed excitement without there was a triple knock and the voice of a man evidently of authority rang out open up here is there anybody in here open i tell you jarvis turned toward the girl whose face reflected a dozen curious emotions as she watched him he made his last appeal it's up to you to do with me as you like he murmured her mind was made up quickly and she pointed toward a door to the left it led to her bath jarvis disappeared behind its shelter at the same instant the door of the maid's room opened and a chic little servant ran out chattering clinging to her mistress's arm for protection be silent was the cool command the knocking continued with more voices joining in the exhortations the girl pointed to the door and the silent command was obeyed trembling like an aspen the little maid opened it and the burly form of a house detective appeared at the entrance are you all right in here he asked and then observing the two white-robed figures he doffed the conventional derby hat without which no professional hotel detective would seem natural i beg your pardon ma'am i just came to see if you had had any trouble no replied the mistress calmly what is the matter mighty sorry to trouble you but we're looking for a party, and we ain't gonna stop till we find him. We just thought he might have beat it into this room for a getaway. If you want anything, just call us, for we'll be up and down these halls all night now. As he shut the door, the unusual young woman waved toward it once more. Lock it well, Nita, she said in Spanish. Control yourself, child. You have a chill. Go to bed again. I will not want you again until six o'clock in the morning. As Nita retired, she hesitated before her doorway. Her sharp black eyes caught the glint of the bulky revolver upon the library table. Those same black eyes dilated. Her lips moved as though for another frightened exclamation. But all she said was, Thank you, madam. I will not bother you again until six o'clock. Good night, madam. Then she closed her door. Nita was as discreet as she was faithful in the service of her beloved madam, and she was essentially Spanish in her appreciative grasp of a romantic situation. End of chapter 3